Uh, welcome to our panel. I'm going to be the moderator playing the role of John McLaughlin. <laughs> Interrogating our panelists on a scale of one to 10. Anyway, welcome to our panel. It's gonna be sort of a wild journey, so sit back and get ready. Uh, Brands is gonna talk about elect presidential elections that were, that were uh, let's say, controversial in their conclusions. And Doug is gonna talk about three-party and four-party elections. And so why don't we start with, uh, with the, your, your choice to begin this. The thank you, uh, Carl. Uh, th thank you all for coming. Delighted to be back at the Rancho Mirage Writers Festival. Should I do with just one election yeah, first yeah. and then we'll go yeah, in turn? Yeah. We'll, we'll, okay. we'll bounce back and forth. So I'm gonna choose the election of 1800. And quite arguably, it was the most important election in American political history in the sense that it marked the first time that the American, the new American system of the Constitution of 1789 was really put to a test. And in a system of electoral politics, the test is not the first election, because anybody can hold the first election. The test is not necessarily the second election, although, as they used to say about the way communists would get into power in Europe, they would get voted in, and that would be the last time there would be elections. So if they do have the second election, that's a good sign. But the real test of the system is the first election in which the incumbents get tossed out. What do the incumbents do? Do they dispute the election? Do they try to prevent the election from being the votes countered, carried out? Or do they say, you know what, we lost, and the appropriate response is to work harder and get elected next time. So in the election of 1800, by the way, this, is, this election is another corrective to the notion that some people have that the US Constitution is sort of holy writ of, of some sort, that the framers of the Constitution got everything right. This is one of the things they got really wrong. So the original method of electing a president was to have electors, just as we have. And they had two votes, just as electors today have two votes. But in those days, there was no distinction between the two votes. So they each got to cast two votes. And the way they worked it is the, the candidate who got the most votes, assuming a majority of the number of electors, was president. And then the one who got the second most votes was the vice president. Now, we think of presidents and vice presidents as working together. They're on a ticket. For the last 100 years, they've always been of the same party. But under this original system, you would get the winner and his arch rival as vice president. Anyway, in 1800, the electoral vote came out to a tie, the only time this has happened. And with a tie, neither of the two candidates has a majority of the electors. So under these circumstances, the Constitution, Article 2, says that if no candidate has a majority of the electors, the race goes to the House of Representatives. Now, in this case, there had been change of parties as well as a potential change of administration. The Federalist Party had dominated American politics during the 1790s. But in the 1800 election, the Federalist majority in Congress was tossed out. And in the presidential race, it was the other party, the Jeffersonian Republicans, whose ticket of Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr won. They defeated John Adams, who was running for re-election. But there was a tie between the person, Jefferson, whom all of the Republicans, all the people who voted for him, understood to be the presidential nominee candidate and the vice presidential nominee, Aaron Burr. But because neither one got a majority, it goes to the House of Representatives in which the decision is gonna be made by the party that had just been kicked out. So this was the lame duck session of the Federalist House. And so the Federalists have it in their hands to decide between these two of their opponents. And they thought long and hard about what they should do. John Adams was president. He was approached by various Federalists to say, you know what? If we simply don't resolve this, then maybe you can stay in office past your end date. Or maybe it will go to, I don't know, a Chief Justice of the Supreme Court who happened to be a Federalist. And the reason this was so consequential was this is early days for the Constitution. And American officials, American voters, were making it up as they went along. Nobody knew what was going to happen if this was indeed the case. And there was finagling among the Federalists, making offers to the VP nominee, Aaron Burr, saying, you know, give us what we want, and we'll vote your way. It was complicated for the Federalists by the fact that Thomas Jefferson, the, the one who was supposed to be president, and thinking of all the people who voted for him, 
was the worst enemy, almost the worst enemy of Alexander Hamilton, who was the leader of the Federalist Party and who had the ear of the people in the Federalist Party in the House who were going to vote. And so you know, who should we vote for? And I'll let you decide if this is to Hamilton's credit or not. Hamilton concluded that while Jefferson's policies were abhorrent to everything that Hamilton believed, Burr's character was abhorrent. Burr's character could not be relied upon. So, and so he urged all of the Federalists to vote for Jefferson to make Jefferson president, which is indeed what happened. But there might have been an ulterior motive, because Hamilton was convinced that the Republicans, Jefferson's ticket, they were, they were leading the country to disaster. And very quickly, American voters would wake up and realize those Republicans are terrible and bring the Federalists back. So he didn't, want to, he didn't want the Federalists, he didn't want himself to be somehow complicit in spoiling what the voters wanted. Let the Republicans destroy themselves. But the lesson from this was that there have been, this is, this is the first contested election in American history. And the lesson that came out of this was when your side loses, Listen to the voice of the people. And don't try to reject the result. Go out and work harder and try to win the next time around. Yeah. Just to add a little color to this, this is a spectacular moment because uh, the vote of the House comes in on February 11th in the middle of a blinding snowstorm in Washington, DC. I mean, it's literally covered with snow. And they're supposed to vote at noon. And there's a real concern among the Democrats that they're going to lose the vote of Maryland because Maryland has four Federalists and four Democrats, but one of the Democrats is supposedly near death and ill, near death, and they're, going to, they're afraid they're going to lose Maryland, that Maryland will vote for Burr because they will have four Federalists to three Democrats. So Joseph of Maryland insists upon being carried on a stretcher two miles through the blizzard and installed in a committee room next door and wheeled out to vote. And they vote. 27 times between noon on the 11th and noon on the 12th. There's a wonderful diarist of the Times who says, you know, basically, you know, they, they were in their sleeping caps and, and uh, blankets and they were lying on the floor and tables and chairs and every so often they'd be roused to vote. They vote 27 times and it doesn't work out any time. It's all in, it's all gummed up. Uh, because the Maryland delegation is, is split, the Vermont delegation is split, South Carolina is split, and then nobody has a majority. So the next day they say, let's slow this sucker up. We'll vote maybe once or twice a day. On the 37th ballot, six days later, it breaks because of the intervention of Alexander Hamilton, who's earlier written a letter to George Baird, the Federalist from Delaware, saying, I hate him, I hate him both, but, quote, Jefferson has concern for his character while Burr has uh, raw and bold ambition, and we, we, the Federalists, will be held responsible for, uh, we will, it will be to our shame and disgrace, uh, we, we, we will be held responsible for what he does. But it really is, is the intervention of an unlikely figure. Admittedly, it took a while for his thinking to get through to George Baird, but Baird says, I'm out of here taking Delaware's vote with me. I convinced the, the Federalists in Maryland to throw in their cards and gets one of the two members of Congress from Vermont to walk out the Federalist, leaving the, the vote in the hands of the Democrats. And on the 37th ballot, remember 15 ballots to elect Kevin McCarthy? This is tw 37 ballots, and the President of the United States is sworn in less than two weeks later. Anyway, f really fun. Now, we've had one bad election. Let's go to another one. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's not the first multi-candidate election, but it's one that, that is the most recent where a third party candidate had a shot to win, Brinkley, 1912. Okay, and a great story with that, Carl. I could just add one quick thing to it, uh, the, you know, the, the guy named Charles Thompson was her secretary of the Continental Congress on the original Declaration of Independence. Two names are on it, John Hancock, Charles Thompson. It's Thompson who helped design the seal of the United States. It's Charles Thompson who chose the eagle over the wild turkey. He was the secretary of the Continental Congress. Because he was for the abolition of slavery, there was no role for Thompson in the Washington administration. But he went to Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania, and took all of the diaries of the founding of our country, the internal debates of Adams and Jefferson, and who's the loyalist to the crown, and all, all of it, 
and was going to do a multiple volume history of the American Revolution, kind of like we got from Winston Churchill in World War II. He was working on it, and he was so dismayed by the chicanery of 1800 and the two-party system <laughs> that he writes Jefferson and John Jay, both letters, that we'll never be able to function as a country if we're doing this. We're going to have to build presidents up uh, after an election because this whole thing is, is a doomsday, and he burned all the founding diaries because he thought it would put shame on Jefferson and Adams because he was trying to record their, their, what they said one April afternoon that would you know, live on like quotes do today. So it really disturbed people at 1800, that election, in the sense of building a cult of George Washington, uh, Parson Ween's books, you know, of, and, of Washington throwing the coin across the Rappahannock River, or I won't tell a lie, Dad, chopping the cherry tree, or um, uh, the city of Washington, with the uh, Washington Monument, state of Washington, it was to keep a presidency, once they're in, you know, big. And Washington did our country such a service, uh, he could have stayed in a, a third term. All right, uh, jump on 112. Then, in 1912, 112 years later. 1912, I, I chose, and Carl was magnanimous letting Bill and I pick. Uh, he knows about all of them, Carl, I promise you, a micro on it all. Uh, I chose 1912 because I'm a big Theodore Roosevelt fan, and it's such a strange moment in, in political history in 1912. TR uh, had been our president from 1901 to 1909. He came in because William McKinley, who Carl's written a, a great book about, uh, McKinley had been uh, assassinated. TR came in as a reformer Republican and, um, and was popular. But he decided in, that he wasn't going to seek a, uh, a re-election. He, he won in 1904 on his own. But in, in, uh, in 1908, he decided there was something, a higher calling, and that was going to Africa to do um, big game hunting, but also collecting for the Smithsonian flora and fauna in Africa. And he was Charles Darwin on the move kind of guy. Um, and um, he had a rubber stamp in William Howard Taft, right? He, it was his hand appointed guy. He picked TR. Taft was a TR loyalist. But uh, Roosevelt became disenchanted with Taft for a few reasons. We won't have time to belabor. But one was the firing of Gifford Pinchot, the chief of the Forest Service. Um, Pinchot, who Yale School of Forestry is named after, is a great scientific forester and from Pennsylvania and became a bull mooser. And a lot of people started telling TR to run, challenge Taft, because they saw Taft as representing Wall Street, big business. I'm simplifying this. but um, And Roosevelt was the swashbuckling reformer who had a lot of charisma. And TR did not get at the convention. He ran as a Republican. He thought he'd be the nominee. And they gave it to Taft. He felt he had been. Um, disingenuously dealt with. And he went with Pinchot and others uh, and said, I'm going to form a progressive party, the Bull Moose Party of 1912, the third most, or the most successful um, third party in US history. And TR uh, it was a Woodrow Wilson from New Jersey, Democrat, William Howard Taft, sitting president, and Theodore Roosevelt um, vying uh, for the top prize. And a big moment occurs when Theodore Roosevelt is in Milwaukee and a, uh, giving, getting ready to give a speech. And an assassin comes up and, um, and shoots him. And TR has blood coming out of him. The, you can go look at the speech in his glasses that the bullet went through. So there he's bleeding. And only Theodore Roosevelt would you know, say, it takes more than a bullet to kill a bull moose. <laughs> and, and continued speaking while he's bleeding on the stage. Um, and waving off medical attention. And uh, eventually, they got him to a hospital in Milwaukee, but then got him to Chicago. And he had to miss a hunk of the campaign uh, due to his infirmity from the wounds. I'm not sure if he ever fully healed from uh, the gunshot wounds. But in the end, um, he, he, he did not succeed in winning. He came in second. But he did succeed in, in killing President Taft and allowing Woodrow Wilson to be president. Why does TR do all that? There's a lot of hubris, TR. You know the line, he had to be the, um, the, he had to be the groom at every wedding and the corpse at every funeral. <laughs> he couldn't have a big election coming in America, and he wasn't in the thick of it. I mean, and, uh, and he went for it. And 
It's now people, when we're looking for third parties or talking about third or fourth parties, sometimes people will invoke that bull moose run. And incidentally, a lot of people joined the bull moose party that were smart, like Secretary of War Henry Stimson, uh, who went on for FDR during World War II, Secretary of War John Knox, the Secretary of Navy. It's a long list. Many of them came later to work for FDR, um, as, um, and the bull moose connects to the New Deal in interesting ways down the pike. Yeah, a little uh, color on that t ties to today. One of the minor things is is that they form this new party, and they're going to run Theodore Roosevelt for president. But all of a sudden, a variety of people say, "You know what? I'm going to be a progressive, and I'm going to run for an office in my state, U.S. senator or governor, on the progressive ticket." And no labels has the same problem because the question was, how do these people become the candidate of the party? Because some of them are lunatics. So if there is a new labels, if there's a no labels party nationwide, uh, what can happen is somebody can say, you know what, I'm in Texas, I want to run for the United States Senate as the candidate of the no labels party, and all it costs is $250 for me to file with the state, and I can become the candidate if there's no primary, and if there are multiple of us, well, you got to figure out how to choose. So in 1912, the progressives had this pop up, and some of the people like the, the La Follettes of Wisconsin and so forth, and, and uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, Pinchot. Yeah, Pinchot and a couple of others said, we want to run as candidates for progressive party. So finally, they had to have a meeting and say, we're in charge of deciding because we don't want to have nuts. Now, the problem is laws no longer allow parties to have that kind of unilateral control over it. But it, uh, as, as Doug said, think about it. The incumbent and president of the United States out of the 48 states carries two and gets eight electoral votes. Theodore Roosevelt carries 88 electoral votes and, and, uh, and Woodrow Wilson has 435. If a third party candidate with a personality as big as Theodore Roosevelt can get wiped out like that, what does it say about the nature of what a third party candidate, if it hopes to win the presidential race as opposed to determine its outcome by influencing uh, who wins, um, you know, what kind of big personality do we have like that in America today? Do you think, Carl, with that no labels will, or they're saying by mid-March, do you think they will run somebody that's, you know, well? I, I, I assume they will because they, they have said if it's Biden versus Trump, Trump versus Biden, they will come up with a candidate. And they also will do what has not been done since 2000. We have two minor parties that are on the ballots of all 50 states, the Libertarians and the Green. And the last one that was created was the Green Party in 2000. And they do decide who the president is. In 2016, in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, the vote for Jill Stein, the Green Party candidate, in those three states is larger than the losing margin of Hillary Clinton. And in 2020, in Arizona, Wisconsin, and Georgia, the vote for the Libertarian candidate, Joe Jurgensen. Anybody know Joe? What, know what Joe does? Joe is a she is a uh, lecturer in psychology at Clemson. Her vote in those three states is larger than Donald Trump's losing margin. So that the third party candidate can have a huge impact on the election. And, 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 and particularly 2016 is emblematic of it because the Green Party vote in, the, in, in, 2020, in 2016 is significantly larger than the Green Party vote in 2012. That is to say, people said, I'm gonna go out and vote for the third party. Six, over 6% 6 of the vote, electorate votes for the third party in 2016. 1.8% vote for it in 2020. But nonetheless, it is a vehicle for people to say, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not voting for either one of these two people. And I'm, my normal inclination in 2016 might have been to vote Democrat and in 2020 to vote Republican. That Libertarian Party call you think can be, it will be on all 50 states? Yeah, they're all 50 states. Now, you know, it's hard. Uh, you mean no labels? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, well, no, both, no labels both, had a yeah. $50 million plan. They, I, I got a look at it a year, a year and a half ago, and they raised the money, and they are executing. They may not be on all 50 states in the District of Columbia, but they're going to be pretty damn close if they aren't. On the other hand, like Evan McMullen, the guy who ran as an independent candidate in 2016, he was on the ballot. There are about 20-some-odd states where it's relatively easy to get on the ballot, and there are you know, 27 or 28 states where it's really hard, difficult, di from difficult to really difficult to get on the ballot. And he was on 23 states, got votes in 37 because a number of states uh, allow and count write-in votes. 
Carl, if I could ask a question here. Is it a matter of state law or party rules that determines which parties are automatically on ballots in the states? State, state, state law. State law. State law. And so state how law. did the Green Party and the Libertarian Party get written into the state laws? How because does that happen? Did they lobby they, the state legislature? Well, no, what they did is they meet thresholds. Uh, it's hard to get on. Is you it have signatures to get, or you have performance to collect, You have to collect election. signatures and so forth to get on. And then you have to field a candidate and meet a threshold to stay on. And the thresholds, once you get on, are relatively small. But getting on is difficult. In some instances, you have to get signatures, qualified signatures, that are equal to 3% or 5% of the number of people who voted in the previous gubernatorial election or the previous presidential election. And look, signature collection is hard. It's expensive. Yeah. And all you got to do is get some lunatic who fills out, you know, I'm Joe Smith. I'm Pocahontas. Yeah. Well, you're not really. That's <laughs> not an eligible voter. <laughs> Very interesting. All right, we're going to go back now. When was the first stolen election in American history? Bill? 1824. <laughs> so I'm jumping back from where Doug was, but ahead from where I was. And I will say that the, the, the last thing to say about the 1800 election was that how do you fix a problem definitively in American politics? How do you fix it beyond interpretation, beyond adjustment? You change the Constitution. And so, in fact, the outcome of the 1800 election gave rise to the 12th Amendment, which specifies now that the electors, they still have two votes, but the two votes are labeled, one for president and one for vice president. And so we're not going to get in a situation again, and not since the 12th Amendment was ratified, will we have a repeat of what happened in 1800, where there was this confusion among the two candidates from the same party. By 1800, the, there was still a big question in American politics as to, well, two things. One, the role of political party. So the Federalist Party and what Carl insists on calling the Democratic Party, but was, they call themselves the Republican Party, they're called the Democratic Republican. This is the Jeffersonian Party. And they'll eventually give rise to the Democratic Party. And I understand why a Republican doesn't want to call them Republicans. Anyway. No, no, no. no. It's nothing against it. I just don't want to confuse this audience. Precisely. <laughs> Precisely. But they, but I'm they, happy to call them the Republican Party because the first, in 1856, the first Republican Party platform calls itself the natural heir to the party of Jefferson. Yeah. Right, right. And I will point out, point. but they might, or our audience today might be confused if they go and read Jefferson's inaugural address, his first inaugural address, in which trying to get past the party sentiment, he says, we are all Republicans, we are all Federalists. He didn't say we're all Democrats. Anyway, so, but. It, oh, okay, Professor Brand. Okay. Mark it down on so, my final paper, okay? Okay, but so the parties are taking shape, except the Federalist Party falls apart. And so all that's left standing is the remnants of the Jeffersonian Party. And what we find is a period that is sometimes called the era of good feelings in American politics. And this is the, the one time in American politics where there aren't two parties bickering with each other. But it turns out it lasts all of about 15 minutes because within the single party, they start bickering. And so the 1824 election features four candidates who, oh, and, and the nomination process was confused in those days because there's nothing in the Constitution that says how the candidates will be nominated. Now, in the very early days, the American political system was almost like a relatively small club, and people knew each other. And so it's like nominating somebody to be president of the Garden Club or something. You know these people. But America is growing. By the 19, 1820s, America is much larger than it was at the time of its founding. There's something else that has changed dramatically, and that is the spirit of democracy is spreading in the land when, in fact, Article two of the Constitution still says that the, we still have electors, and it says that the states shall determine how the electors are chosen. It's up to the states. And we live at a time when all of the states allow voters to vote for one candidate or another. In reality, what they're voting for is a, a slate of electors, but we've handed it off to the people. That is, I should say the people have seized control of this. But in the 1820s, this was relatively new. In the early days, most of the states appointed the electors. The state legislatures chose the electors. And so the races for the state legislature were, in a sense, the races to see who would have the electors, and that's the way you would vote for a president. 
But by the 1820s, enough states had adopted popular voting for the electors that, in fact, the 1824 election is the first one that, that typically reports popular vote totals. If you look at the how many, how much of the popular vote did George Washington get? There's no way of telling. There were some states that allowed popular vote for electors, but it's not, they, nobody recorded it. It was simply the electors that mattered. But by the time you get up to 1824, if you look at you know, records of how the votes went, you have a popular vote total announced for the first time. And the winner of the first popular vote, excuse me, the plurality candidate in this, um, the first popular vote was Andrew Jackson. And Andrew Jackson was the second example of a successful general going into politics. George Washington was the first. Andrew Jackson, after the great victory of the Battle of New Orleans in 1815, was often acclaimed as the second Washington. And he was often called just the hero. And people said to him, as they, people said to Theodore Roosevelt in 1912, you could be president. You could be president. And Jackson, and Jackson, um, he professed to disdain politics. He was above politics. But if the people call, I must answer. <laughs> so Andrew Jackson was the popular candidate. He got the most popular votes. He got the most electoral votes, but he did not get a majority of the electoral votes. And as in the case of 1800, if nobody gets a majority of electoral votes, the race goes to the House of Representatives. And the top three vote getters are they don't make the finals in the House of Representatives. The fourth place finisher in this race was Henry Clay. Henry Clay of Kentucky, who was somewhat miffed that Andrew Jackson had stolen the mantle of the hero of the West. So Henry Clay thought of himself as the great man of the West, the Trans-Appalachian region in Kentucky. And all of a sudden now, it's Andrew Jackson who's being lionized. So Clay was not favorably inclined toward Jackson in the first place. Clay's politics didn't align with Jackson's politics. And Clay was, at least he said, that he was very concerned at the idea that you could go from the battlefield, in essence, to the White House. That there was a sort of Caesarism going on here. And that, in fact, Clay went so far as to call Jackson a military chieftain. And Jackson took this quite amiss, in fact, on his deathbed. Jackson was asked, so if you could live again, what would you do differently? He said, if I could live again, I would hang John Calhoun and shoot Henry Clay. The, the Calhoun story is a, a sidebar to this. But anyway, so the race goes to the, goes to the House of Representatives, where Henry Clay is Speaker of the House. And furthermore, in the House of Representatives, I didn't point this out earlier, and was in the vote for president, it's not by the, the representatives themselves don't vote. They vote by state delegations. So it's kind of a throwback to, it's either a throwback to the Articles of Confederation, or it's sort of a mimicking of what the Senate does. Anyway, and so Henry Clay, Henry Clay looks at the candidates, and he concludes that the second place finisher, John Quincy Adams, is better qualified to be president than Andrew Jackson. Now, I have no reason to doubt Henry Clay's sincerity on this. His politics align and so on. And he, John Quincy Adams was probably better prepared by experience and education to be president than just about anybody in history. He was the son of a president. He'd been brought up in politics and diplomacy and all this. So for Henry Clay to say it ought to be John Quincy Adams was not particularly surprising. And so Henry Clay lobbied to swing the House vote to John Quincy Adams, who thereby won. But the, the fact that Henry Clay could honestly say that Adams was preferable to Jackson did not persuade Jackson and did not persuade Jackson's followers, especially when shortly after it becomes clear that John Quincy Adams is going to be president of the United States, John Quincy Adams turns around and appoints Henry Clay Secretary of State. Now, you might not think that's a particularly big deal, except that in those days, the path to the White House ran through the Secretaryship of State. And so by making Henry Clay Secretary of State, he was, John Quincy Adams was, to all appearances, making Henry Clay the heir apparent to the presidency. And it's at this point that Jackson said, 
that there has been a corrupt bargain, and the Jacksonians concluded that the election had been stolen. Now, to their credit, they didn't attempt to resist the change in administration. What they did was they immediately, John Quincy Adams had hardly been inaugurated than the legislature, the state legislature of Tennessee, and, and this is, you could get nominated by your home state legislature. So the state legislature of Tennessee nominated Andrew Jackson for president in 1828. And the election is still three and three quarters years in the future. And it began at that point. So if you think campaigns these days are long, got nothing on the 1820s. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Bill has a fantastic biography of Jackson, which if you, if you want to read more about this, and particularly the period of 1824 to 1828, where he rails in letters and meetings, uh, pick up Bill's book, because it really is terrific. Two minor points here. Uh, first of all, 12th Amendment, if you think that issue's gone away, it hasn't. In 2000, George W. Bush decided he wanted his running mate to be Richard B. Cheney, formerly a congressman from the state of Wyoming. The only problem was Dick had moved to Dallas where he was the CEO of Halliburton, and the 12th Amendment says you cannot ca cast the electoral votes of a state for the president and vice president if they're both from the same state. So we had to get Cheney to go back and re-register in, in, in Wyoming in order for him to be then named as Bush's running mate. So the 12th Amendment still has an effect today. Uh, Bill mentioned something that's really interesting. Except for the state of Massachusetts, it is not until uh, 1824, 1828 that states begin to routinely and regularly collect statistics on the election results in presidential elections. And the only way that we can sort of determine what the results were in earlier elections is a result of one eccentric guy named Philip Lampe. This guy was a orphan in a boy's home in 1960 who began to go through all the newspapers of the area and collect, like in 1800, the election for the electors is the election, as Bill suggested, for the New York legislature, which happens in April of 1800, and that's where Aaron Burr, by spectacularly winning the legislative races, becomes the running mate of Thomas Jefferson. Lampe, as literally a teenager and for the rest of his life, goes to all of the newspapers because the newspapers would collect the returns of you know what happened in Maine or what happened in part of Vermont, or Britain, and he meticulously pulled this data together. So we know that in 1800 that roughly 151,000 votes were cast on behalf of the Republicans under Jefferson <laughs> and about 130 some odd thousand votes cast for the Federalist under John Quincy Adams in various sundry forms. Some of them, very rarely were they direct, you know, dirty. we're voting for the, uh, the, the, the elector for John Adams, but we're voting for, uh, you know, somebody who then will become the elector. But it's really interesting, the guy, you know, he literally took this up, he later admitted, because he did, he did not want to have any, uh, you know, sort of uh, intercourse with all of his classmates at the boys' orphanage. He didn't like other people, and this was something that nobody else was interested in, so he wouldn't be bothered, and he devoted his entire life to the collection of this, and it's now online by the Antiquary Society of New England or something like that. <laughs> okay. Anyway, all right, next up, 1948. Um, great, Bill, that was wonderful. And, I, and while we're calling out books, I see um, um, Jeffrey Cohen of, of the University of Southern California, Annenberg, who's written on Theodore Roosevelt and lots here. And so look his book. He, uh, he, up. Let me yeah. sell the book. He has a fantastic book about how Theodore Roosevelt, it's the first time we have primaries. Yeah. And, and the reason that Roosevelt is so angry is because he's winning the primaries. It's the bosses in the back room who are, who are keeping the nomination from him. And, and Jeffrey's written a terrific book on on the Cohen, C O W A N, 1912. Uh, get online and get the book. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and um, and I also, you know, one of the things, guys, when we are dealing with something like presidential power, you know, it's not in the Constitution, say, executive orders. Although Washington had one executive order on neutrality, all this period we're talking about, 1820s, all it, we, it really changes America with the Civil War and when Abraham Lincoln does what some people will call executive order number one, the Emancipation Proclamation. And you start drifting into more modern times and thinking about how we're going to do things due to the ability of transportation, 
issues. We have railroads now, automobiles, and things change. And then, of course, uh, televised conventions, et cetera. Um, but I, I'd be remiss if, if, since we're in this third party uh, moment, just not to say one thing. 1860, uh, Abraham Lincoln was not on the ballot in most southern states. I mean, you couldn't vote for Lincoln in a lot of states. Um, the Republican Party was seen as a newfangled thing, the John C. Fremont, 1856. So key, some people will see Lincoln as a third party uh, candidate in many ways. I don't necessarily think of it that way, but I, I throw it out there. I picked 1848 because I, I was conspiring with Carl on the idea of um, it is a topic now of these third and fourth parties in 2024. In 1948, you know, Harry Truman came in, as you know, FDR died April 12th, 1945, Warm Springs, Georgia. Um, you know, uh, Truman said, I felt like the moon and the stars had dropped on my shoulders. FDR was remiss in not communicating with his own vice president uh, about Yalta details, uh, let alone the Manhattan Project. So it was a big learning curve for Truman. He finds out at Potsdam about uh, the successes in New Mexico, and he greenlights Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, World War II ends. You would think uh, Truman would be hugely popular as the president of VE Day, VJ Day. And if you look from 45 all the, up till when he ran on his own in 48, he's scoring all sorts of, of successes, but at the same time, he's alienating a lot of people. Who's he alienating? A lot of Democrats. Uh, when you integrate the armed forces on race like Harry Truman does, um, a lot of Southerners weren't happy about uh, his civil rights uh, platform of Harry Truman. And many of the progressives, meaning Eleanor Roosevelt, New Deal liberals, thought we could be great friends with Russia and that we didn't need a Cold War. And they didn't agree with Winston Churchill's 1946 uh, uh, Iron Curtain speech in Fulton, Missouri, um, that Russia was this new big enemy like Hitler. And they, and they didn't believe some of the, on the left, if you'd like, on uh, you know, George Kennan's Mr. X article or containment theories. Cut to 1948, and uh, it looks like uh, Truman is in deep trouble to win on his own. Um, that there's not a lot of, um, of a, a lot of a coattail of, of FDR left. After all, guys, right? Winston Churchill lost after World War II. You know, the great Winston Churchill loses to labor. Um, but what really disturbed Truman in 1948 running is Strom Thurmond and the Dixiecrats largely over civil rights issues, break off from the Democratic Party. Um, FDR was kind of masterful at keeping a, a white a Southern Democrats in his coalition. Um, but here, they're forming a third party, Dixiecrat. And then Henry Wallace, a bull mooser, way back, but who ended up being vice president for Franklin Roosevelt, and, and, and FDR traded him out for Truman, he joins forces with Eleanor Roosevelt and forms a progressive party in 48, saying we, we don't need a Cold War, we don't need another war. Meaning two big hunks of Truman's coalition are now on third party runs. And he's, uh, you know, people are starting to say to air is Truman. Um, and, and, and he wasn't clear he's going to be able to pull that off. As you famously know, everybody here knows the newspaper of Chicago, you know, Dewey beats Truman. It was seen as a neck and neck affair. But alas, Truman squeaks by. Um, I think that election in Truman's win is seen as any candidate who's behind in the polls and pundits are saying they can't win. They, 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 they dream that the last hope is the Harry Truman Hail Mary pass. If, you know, everybody counted him out, but Truman won again. And I see that this might be folding into play with Joe Biden right now. I mean, uh, the underestimation of Biden, which has been part of his career, but you're seeing within Democratic Party, ostensible Democrats, but people that were deep in the party forming third parties. So Cornell West um, is now going to be on the ballot, they think, in about 30 states. And one of them is Michigan. And he's appealing to Arab American voters and Dearborn that may have been Biden voters, but it, it's going to dent a little bit. But we're dealing with points here, as Carl knows. You got Cornell West going. You got Jill Stein, a Green Party 
Some people just hear the word green, and if they're disenfranchised, they might vote Green Party because they think, even though Biden's done more on climate than any president, they, they might feel he's still an energy fossil fuel guy. I don't know who pulls people to Jill Stein, but she might get a point here or there. And, um, and uh, Bobby Kennedy Jr. is just a wild card. I mean, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, I think if he, if he gets 5% of the vote, I think it'll hurt Trump. But you know, if he somehow gets 15%, or it might really be coming out of Biden voters, meaning black Americans that aren't happy, uh, young people that are dissatisfied, just people that are angry at the system, Generation Zers who don't like two 80-year-olds. I'm just saying he's getting it. And then, Carl, uh, and we've just touched on no labels. I mean, what if they put up somebody like Nikki Haley and, uh, and uh, a mansion or something? I'm not suggesting that's happening. I'm just saying, if they really are going to have to put up a candidate, it's going to be somebody. And where's that vote coming from? So like in 48, I think the third parties are significant. Um, obviously, none of them are going to do well. I don't even know of any. I don't think any, unless there's some fluke somewhere uh, we don't have time for. Um, but I, So they're not going to be scoring electoral votes. But they can very easily change an election outcome, and Carl was the master of knowing how close Florida was in 2000, and there are people that blame Nader um, entrance into that. Don't, I don't want to really litigate whether that. Uh, we did invite him to a Christmas party, but don't read anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, two, 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 two pieces of color yeah. about 1948. Go on, one, one, one point that you made about Truman went on the attack. Yes. One of the interesting things is oftentimes uh, people lose races because, not because of somebody does something right on the other side, but they do something wrong themselves. In 1944, Dewey is the nominee of the Republican Party, and he goes after Roosevelt aggressively. He attacks him for corruption. He attacks him for ostensibly, his allies attack him for ostensibly taking a destroyer in order to bring his dog Fala to, uh, to him. And, and, but they're, they're, they're saying, War profiteering is taking place. There's corruption in government spending, and it's all at Roosevelt's feet, and it was aggressive, and he loses. Does better than Wilkie in 40, but loses. And in 48, he makes a conscious decision that he is not going to attack uh, Truman in the same way that he attacked Roosevelt. And he's going to float above it all. He yeah. thinks the American people want somebody who's going to be focused on, here's what I'm going to do as president, and doesn't take a two-by-four to Truman. And as a result, Truman takes a two-by-four to him. Great. And one of, so one of the lessons out of 48 is you better have, you, you can't just simply say I'm winning, and, you know, I'm going to win by saying I'm going to do things and I'm going to be new and different. You've got to have something that says and I'm better than the other guy. That's a great point in 48 that he's making. I, that I could give 10, but I'll give you two. Uh, Truman's uh, backing of Israel. Do you realize Dean Acheson, Secretary of State, opposed the creation of Israel. James Forrestal opposed it. George, George Marshall. Marshall opposed yeah. it. It's Truman... Clark Clifford and some others who did something said, no, we're going yeah. for that. That was a big election year uh, call. Uh, but, and then in Berlin, uh, he stuck to Berlin, Truman, and the airlift that he does in Berlin was magnificent, and it worked, and it showed spine and backbone yeah. as commander in chief. There are others, but yeah, you're yeah. right. Yeah, I think, I think, but he also went after Dewey. And went, went after Dewey, went yeah. after Dewey hard. hard. The other thing is interesting, you mentioned the name Clark Clifford. This is one of my favorites about the 48 race. In 1947, Clark Clifford presents a memo to Harry S. Truman saying, you're in trouble. You're going to lose the South. You got, you got problems with the black vote. The black vote is starting to drift back into the Republican uh, column in places like Chicago and Philadelphia and New York. We'll carry it but it's going to be substantial enough for the Republicans that we may lose these critical battleground states. He sculpts out what the 1948 race is going to look like and does so a year and a half before and writes a brilliant memo, a brilliant memo about what Truman ought to do. You ought to go hard on the issue of race. We're going to lose the southern, some southern states regardless, so it at least ought to have the upside. The, 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 the whole question of of what's going to happen in the Middle East. We must, the Jewish vote is going to be critical in New York and New Jersey. We need to make certain we're close to it. Brilliant. And for years and years and years, we have given credit to Clark Clifford for this memo. But it's not his memo. <laughs> the memo is actually written by James Rowe, who is official in the budget, budget office of the White House, who writes the memo and then gives two copies 
one copy to a friend, and one copy to Clark Clifford, whom he hates. And he does this because James Rowe was the sort of chief of staff to FDR in 1940 when FDR endorses for the U.S. Senate in Missouri the governor of Missouri rather than the incumbent senator, Harry S. Truman. And Harry Truman could not blame Roosevelt, so he blamed James Rowe. And Rowe is a young official in the administration. He's the guy who has to deliver the word to Truman, the boss is going for the governor, not you. So he writes this memo and deliberately gives a copy to Clifford because he knows Clifford is an ass kisser and, it's gonna, and that, that he'll, he'll take it and use it for his own, and he does. Roe has a storied career in Washington as a lobbyist and a head of various groups, dies at the age of 75, but he's the guy who wrote the memo. I taught a class at UT. I talked about this, and we, we, we study the memo because it's really brilliant, and I told, I happened to say to, in the class, I told them about the story of James Rowe, and all of the students had to write a very serious paper. And one of my students, brilliant young woman, said, I want to go do that. I want to find out about that. So she goes, she gets the James Rowe oral history, where he's very you know, delicate about it. He's not saying anything. She gets the original James Rowe memo. She puts it and the Clark Clifford memo together in one of these uh, computer programs for plagiarism. And like 90% of the Clark Clifford memo <laughs> is plagiarized. That guy would be out as president of, the uni uh, of Harvard University had he been made it. <laughs> but it's one the, to me, it is one of the great, here's a guy who selflessly says, I want to get Truman reelected. I want my party to win. But if I give him this advice, he's going to say, screw you. You were the guy who, who told FDR to come against me. So he gives it to the ass kisser who's going to take it, put his name on it, and get everything going in the right direction. Okay. Anyway, we're out of time. Um, I think we're out of time. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to thank our yeah. panelists, and thank you for coming.